The Tulsa officials turned down all the offers under the guise of handling the problems themselves. From a 10 room and basement modern brick home, I'm now living in my coal barn. From a five chair enamel barber shop with four workmen and a porter to a razor strap and a folding chair on the sidewalk. Didn't have one thing left and never received a dime. Up until this day, they never. And it ought to be added in order that it'll be made pay. Even the children have suffered. Our children have suffered because their parents lost everything they had and the children weren't able to, to get along and they were doing fine. The Red Cross took donations and performed an admirable job with little help from government officials. Returning to the Red Cross headquarters, I found rows of women, men and children waiting their turn to receive clothing such as was obtainable. And the thing that I could not understand was why these innocent people who were helpless as babes were placed under guard. Nevertheless, heavily armed guards were all around the building. Some were kind and manly. Others were beasts dressed in uniforms upstairs into the clothing room in a quest of a change of clothing for my little girl. Having worked hard always for an independent living, thereby being able to have what I wanted within reason, this was wormwood and gall to me. Just to be standing around waiting to get a change of secondhand clothing. But what could I do? What we had on was soil. They being all we had, and I was not yet permitted to go to town and purchase more. The primary rooms of the Book of Washington School were converted into an emergency hospital. I can never erase the sights of my first visit to the hospital. There were men wounded in every conceivable way, like soldiers after a big battle. Some with amputated limbs, burned faces, others minors and I are with heads bandaged. There were women who were nervous wrecks in some confinement cases. One mother was thoughtless as to burden her infant for life with the name of June Riot. Mary Jones Parish. Fourteen hundred claims were made by black citizens for their losses during this riot. Not one, not a single claim was ever paid any of these black citizens for their losses. But there was a claim paid to a white store owner for his loss of guns and ammunition that was used by white rioters. Now you have to ask yourself, what's wrong with this picture? Many humorous instances might be cited of claims presented by innocent bystanders for the payment of doctor bills. Now, all such claims were originally investigated, and many were turned down for the reasons that it could not be shown that the wounded parties were innocent bystanders, or persons in the employ of the city or the county for guard purposes. Quite early in the fall, a claim for a $55,000 doctor bill was presented by a young white man for a gunshot wound treatment. The claim was of the innocent bystander kind. After lengthy explanation on the part of the claimant as to how the injury was incurred, but after his admission that he was not employed by the city or county, the Red Cross record keeper confronted him with a full-sized photograph of the same young man in the middle of the riot district with a shotgun over his shoulder and a high-powered rifle in his hand. Although he did not deny the identity, he has not been seen at the Red Cross office since. After this experience, no further claims have been made by innocent bystanders. Mr. Maurice Willows, Director of Red Cross Relief. A tent city was constructed to house refugees. 
Embarrassed city officials, white newspapers, the clergy, and the Chamber of Commerce perpetuated the myth that white Tulsa had an outpouring of aid into the devastated black community. In fact, just the opposite was true. With homes looted, homes and stores burnt to ashes, with sick, aged, and enfeebled carried out or left to perish in the flames, mothers giving birth to children in the open, herded, guarded, and corralled like prisoners of war, and before the smoke of a thousand homes had blown away, the trembling and homeless learned that the city fathers had passed an ordinance making it forever impossible for them in their destitute condition to go back and rebuild on their home place. G.A. Gregg. The city council or commissioners uh, passed an ordinance that there could be no construction in the city of Tulsa that was not fireproof. Now, with people absolutely without any resources, uh, it was impossible for them to conform to any requirement that they rebuild only fireproof structures. And my father said, you build if they arrest you, I'll get you out of jail. You can go on, go on building. And my dad had challenged the constitutionality of that, or that city ordinance. And the Supreme Court of the state of Oklahoma declared that ordinance unconstitutional as being a frivolous piece of legislation designed to keep blacks down. With their hearts bleeding, their home and all of the relics that make the memories of life's past sustaining with shocking realization that their families are broken and scattered and fearing the mob with trembly, weak, hungry and hungerless bodies compelled to be in the stalls of the fairgrounds under a heavy, cruel guard who greets them with harsh orders and vulgar language while suffering all this and more the mayor, commissioners, the real estate exchange, the welfare board are like those who crucified Christ, yeah. casted lots for the Negro's hard-earned land. G.A. Gray. Not only was the area declared a fire zone, which effectively uh, was designed to prevent it from being rebuilt, but then amazingly, uh, just incredibly, the city fathers put the land up for sale. Through the Reconstruction Committee appointed by the mayor and city commissioners June 14th, Tulsa extends a welcoming hand to wholesale houses and industrial plants, which are to be located on the trackage property in Little Africa, swept by fire, and which is now within the city fire limits, restricted to the erection of fire-resisting buildings. The committee also expressed a sentiment in favor of using a part of the burned area for a union station whenever such a project is ready for consideration by the railroads entering Tulsa. Tulsa World, June 15, 1921. In order to help people get in touch with their loved ones who were anxious to hear from them, Mr. Theo Bowman, the Oklahoma son, succeeded in getting out a little daily paper. Each day, he would publish these lists. Each day, people sat under the tent and watched for these lists, as well as the lists of dead in the big dailies. The dead were so quickly disposed of on that night and day until it was impossible to ever get an exact record of the dead and wounded. A cousin and I decided to go visit somebody, and we passed down by the cemetery there at Levens and Lewis, the old Oakland Cemetery. And as we went down the Levin Street, why, we saw a bunch of men working, digging a pit, evidently, and we noticed a bunch of wooden crates lying around. So we were very curious about it, so we went in to have a look. And uh, we walked up to the first crate, and we were unnoticed by the men. And uh, we opened the first crate, looked in, and there were the bodies of three black men. 
We shut the lid down real quick and uh, proceeded to go over to the next crate, which is much larger, and opened it, and there was at least four bodies in that crate. They were all just piled in there. And by that time, the men noticed us and ran us out. 